Well, we have uh, some special unexpected guests with us tonight that we ought to recognize the false grass, Peter and Donna. We uh, appreciate them. They're keeping Africa pretty much straightened out, I understand. Yeah. We left it with them, and look at the mess they've made. No, they, they do. <laughs> there you go. They're wonderful people, and if you don't know them, get to know them. Do a wonderful work in Kenya and, and uh, the surrounding area, and we're just uh, pleased to know them and pleased to, to uh, be able to uh, say they're our friends. So we're glad you're here tonight, too, missionaries to Tucson. Amen. We're glad you're here. If you got a Bible with you, look in Luke chapter 18. Hey, we graduated from 17. Are you not happy? For those of you that are not uh, regularly with us, sometimes it takes me months to get past one chapter. We didn't do too bad on 17. We just spent about a couple of months there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. I was looking through 18 and thinking, boy, this is going to take a while. There's some good stuff here. Amen. Luke chapter 18. And uh, we'll begin reading with the first verse. And we'll read the first eight verses. Then he spoke a parable to them. Oh, there we go. Right away you have an a, a exegetical conundrum. Who's them? Who's he talking to? There you go. You've got to read chapter 17 to figure it out. Right? Who's he talking to? His disciples. There you go. He started off chapter 17 talking to... Uh, the deadhead, or the middle of chapter 17, talking to the deadhead Pharisees, but he switched over to his disciples and started explaining to them what he was talking to the Pharisees about. So he's still talking to his disciples. He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man. That's a hard hearted man, and it would actually admit that to himself. <laughs> Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. <laughs> then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? So I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, um, I've heard all kinds of interesting stuff preached out of this passage. And quite frankly, it's always been one of those passages that... Uh, um, I'm going to say bothered me, but I read it and I think I must not be getting this. Y'all got some places like that where you read it over and you think, huh? What's that about? Amen. So my, my usual uh, uh, remedy for that situation when I have a passage that I get the, the quizzical look on my face when I read it is I just don't preach that. You know? and if, you're, if you're a preacher, I, I, would, I would commend that to you. If you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. Amen. <laughs> so, but uh, one of the things we know that he couldn't be doing, because this always used to bother me, uh, he couldn't be comparing the Lord to an unjust judge. Amen. I'm thinking that, that the Lord is not an unjust judge, and he certainly wouldn't use that to describe himself in this parable. What he's telling us about the unjust judge then is not that God is going to act like this unjust judge. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. What people usually teach from that is, of course, that if we really want something from the Lord, we just need to keep nagging him about it until he finally gives up and gives it to us. I don't think that's what he's trying to teach us. Amen. I think if we drop back and remember who he's talking to, who the them is in this verse, that we'll get a bit of a clue. If you'll remember correctly, we wound up last time with the buzzards. Chapter 17, remember? Where you see them vultures, that's where the whole thing is going to be happening. What's going to be happening? Well, the second coming. 
the Son of Man. See, he's still talking about the same thing to his disciples. He's talking about the return of the Lord at the end of the tribulation period, amen, to come and set up his kingdom on the earth. That's what he's been talking about all the way through the last half of chapter 17, and he hasn't changed the subject. He's still talking to his disciples. And remember, he was talking to them and warning them about not getting carried away by people that came and said, look, here's the Messiah over here, and look, there he is over yonder. Don't be swayed by that stuff. Keep steady. Amen. And don't be dissuaded by the people that persecute you uh, because you're serving the Lord. Amen. So we talked about that a little bit, but he's still talking about the same thing. He said, uh, when you're in that situation, when the going gets tough and times are rough and there might even be buzzards circling around, keep praying. Amen. Stay plugged in. Keep seeking the Lord. Amen. Uh, don't give up just because the going gets tough. In our modern day, we don't preach along those lines very much because we want everybody to feel good and think that everything's going to be uh, butterflies and, and lollipops, but it's not, especially in this last hour. Amen. So uh, Luke tells us uh, several things that we can, we can derive from this passage. He's speaking to his disciples about his return at the end of the tribulation and encouraging them that no matter how much persecution they endure for his sake, they should never lose faith and quit praying for his return. And he's promising that he will avenge them. We don't preach that much anymore either. There's whole sections in the New Testament we don't preach anymore because it bothers people. But he also is telling them that, uh, telling these folks that God is just and will protect his people. And in this hour that we're living in, I think that's a pretty important message to get a hold of. <laughs> Amen. Because if all you do is listen to the news, you could get a little nervous. Amen. The first thing Luke tells us about this passage, and I'm going to pull three things out of here that I think we need to, to uh, learn from this. But the first one is don't quit praying. Amen. <laughs> Prayer, dear friends, is the number one a tool in the toolkit of every Christian. If you don't have a prayer life, then you're not living a Christian life. It should be our first resort and not our last resort. Amen. No matter how tough times get. I mean, sometimes we think, well, things are really bad and I really need to get up and get going and do something. I don't have time to pray. I need to do something. Well, praying is doing something. And you need to do that first. <laughs> Amen. You'd be shocked if you'll pray about stuff, how much of the rest of the stuff you think you need to do disappears before you get there. Hey, I'm serious. I try to make it a habit not to just go charging off doing what I think would be a good idea. Because I prove beyond a shadow of any reasonable doubt that what I think is a good idea rarely is. Amen. <laughs> I mean, until I was 30-something years old, I did what I thought was a good idea. I kept winding up, locked up, and tied up <laughs> by people I didn't even like. Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. So my best ideas are not really something you want to participate in. So I discovered if I'd take time to pray, it's amazing how much of that stuff would straighten itself out before I got there, and I needed that. But prayer is a part of our Christian life, our first and not our last resort. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the 15th verse, he says, See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful and never stop praying. Amen. Sometimes those two verses we should preach, right? Always be joyful and never stop praying. That would be a good text to just take, wouldn't it? Cheer up and pray. Amen. Ephesians 6, the 18th verse, we, we like to preach on the, on the armor of God because it breaks itself down into a, a, a nice several-week series for most preachers. But, but it, he winds up that section on the armor of God by saying, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In verse 18, he says, pray. Pray in the Spirit. How often, Paul? At all times and on every occasion. Amen. How often should we pray? At all times and on every occasion. And then he says, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers. Praying for what, Paul? For all believers everywhere. Verse 19, and while you're at it, pray for me too. 
Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I'll keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. So the apostle Paul said, be persistent in your prayer for all the saints everywhere and for me. Uh, we, we uh, a few months ago, went through the New Testament and picked out a few of the things Paul said to pray for. Did you know a lot of the stuff we pray for, he never ad admonished us or taught us to pray for at all? Uh, most of the times when he says uh, to the church to pray, he said, when you pray, pray for all the other saints that they'll fulfill the will of God for their lives and pray for me that I get this gospel preached. Amen. Uh, I believe we spend a lot of our time praying for ourselves when, when uh, God's wanting us to be praying for the work of God around the earth. I've always had the idea that if the whole body of Christ fulfilled the will of God for them, that we could uh, just wrap this baby up and go into the house. Amen. I'm, I'm not sure this is as much work as we think it, we try to make it. Because most of us, you know, we'd rather go down to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the picture show and watch somebody else do something. Cheer for them, cry for them, get all excited and emotional about it, and then when it's over, let's go get something to eat. Amen. I mean, I'm not against putting on a good show at church, but that's not what church is supposed to be about. Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the 11th verse, he said, God sent some in the church, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you notice that? How does the body of Christ get edified? It gets edified when the saints do the work of the ministry that were, they were prepared for. Uh, by the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. We come to church to get prepared to work. Amen. <laughs> and I got a funny feeling that if we all did the work that we were called and prepared to do, we might just wrap this deal up. How many of you ever had a job where you felt like you was the only one doing anything? <laughs> Anybody else ever worked for the government? I did. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when I, was, I, I worked for the, the post office, and I worked for the state of Oklahoma, and I worked for the uh, Veterans Administration on different occasions over the year. And I discovered that uh, there's a premium in those situations on not doing anything. Because if they catch you doing something, then they're afraid that it'll catch on. It'll become a movement, and then they'll be expected to do something. So they try to hold you back if at all possible. Amen. You understand the government don't make any money, they just take yours. So, so the motivation there is a little lacking. And when you, when you run your own business, you know, you're looking to sell stuff and make stuff and do stuff. Why? Because you're trying to make a living. When you're working for the government, you're trying to get them to give you stuff. How do you do that? By creating the perception of a need. One place I worked, they actually told us, we have to make sure there's in a hospital. We have to keep our, but our bed count up, our occupancy rate up. Why? Because that's how we got our appropriation. Based on the number of bed people we had in the bed. So we didn't care if you're sick or not, you stay in. <laughs> Y'all laughing, I'm just telling you how it <laughs> <word. laughs> I'm telling you the truth. That's how we made money, so that we, we got paid to keep people in the hospital, so we kept them. Another hospital I worked in, uh, we discovered, this was in a mental health place, I discovered there that uh, when it, it was a private hospital, and private insurance always tells you how many days they'll cover for what kind of condition. Amen. So if they tell you, well, you, you depress, so you get to be in the hospital for 15 days. What we noticed was that all depressed people miraculously got well on the 14th night. <laughs> it was astonishing. Miracle every time. You could just count on it. How'd I get on that? Anybody know? No? Oh, yeah, if everybody do the job they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Amen. If our goal was actually to be successful in what the Lord has commissioned us to do, and we measured our success that way and got busy trying to produce disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, ain't no telling what we could get done for dark. Amen. So, we ought to pray, all right. But I don't think he's telling us 
to pray and nag the Lord until he gives us something. I, I know that because there's some other scriptures where he said just the opposite of that. So the Lord is not confused. Some people think he's a little, you know, adult-pated. You know, he said one thing one day and the next day he says something else, but no. No, he said in, the, in Malachi chapter 3 in the 6th verse, he said, I am the Lord thy God and I change not. One lady said we ought to put that up in the nursery. <laughs> well, she did. I, this is a true story. <laughs> he ain't going to change him. You're going to have to. So, but in Matthew chapter 6, in the seventh verse, you remember Jesus is getting ready to give him what the people refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but he made this remarkable statement. He said, when you pray, notice he didn't say if you pray. He said, don't use vain repetitions like the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. So he's telling them this is just the opposite of, of uh, what some people manage to derive out of Luke 18 about that poor woman nagging that unjust judge. They think if you nag God long enough, he'll just get irritated and give you what you want. Come on now, you've heard that. I know you have. They don't say it that way, but that's what it comes out as, right? He said, uh, they think their prayers, New Living Translation, are answered by repeating their words again and again. And in the, uh, in the Message Bible, in the seventh verse, I love this, this cracked me up. He said, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Whew, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, stop and preach that, huh? So uh, clearly, the Lord was saying, don't think that you're going to be heard because you just keep nagging the Lord about it. So that can't be what he's teaching us then when we get over to Luke 18. And then again, most of us, we're from that old, old school faith crowd, you know. Uh, we read Mark eleven twenty four, And when we read Mark eleven twenty four, we found out he told us, what things wherever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and ye shall have them. He said we're supposed to believe we got it when we prayed. So if we believe we got it when we prayed, why are we asking them about it again? Are you with me? Amen. So, so that can't be what he's saying, just keep nagging him till you get it. No, he said if you want it, believe you got it and you'll have it. Amen. Philippians 4, verse 6, he said, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. With thanksgiving, what's that mean? Thank Him because you believe you received what you prayed for. Amen. Amen. So, obviously, He wants us to pray, and He doesn't want us to think that we're going to continue, uh, or to, we're going to get God to do something because we continue to harass and harangue Him long enough. I don't think that's it. But He does want us not to give up on praying. Use your faith. He's talking here to Jews about the trials they're about to face. Amen. And that they will face before the return of the Lord. When he uses the term son of man, that's a messianic prophetic term from the book of Daniel. Referring to the Messiah himself who stands before the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 7. So, uh, they knew what he was talking about. They knew that the end is coming. There's going to be great distress in the earth don't quit praying during that time. Remember the last question he asked in this passage, passage is, uh, will he find faith when he comes back? Will there be anybody left who didn't quit and give up in the face of the hardship? He said, keep praying, keep hanging in there, because he is going to come and avenge you. Hallelujah. What's that mean? It means he's telling us that don't give up because God does have your back. God does protect His people. Sometimes it don't seem like it's happening, but it always happens. I, I particularly myself like Psalm 34, 7, where he said, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Glory to God. The angels of God are camped around me. And they're not just out there cooking hot dogs. They're out there to help me. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, do you remember uh, that story over in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, where the prophet Elisha had been messing around with, uh, with the Syrians, you know. 
The kings of, King Aram was, was trying to, to uh, mount an attack on Israel. And every time he'd get ready to, to set an ambush, you know, Elisha would tell the Israelites where the ambush was. Well, he's a prophet, for goodness sake. Trying to attack a prophet could be hard. And so the, the, the king said, well, who's over there? Who's, who's, uh, who? We got a spy in the camp. And one of his men says, we don't have a spy in the camp. There's a prophet over there. He keeps telling off on us. So, so the king in his infinite wisdom said, we need to send a bunch over there and capture that prophet. That ain't going to be that easy, buddy. Trust me. Remember that? And uh, so they, they came over and they circled the whole city. And in the morning, the, the, uh, the, the prophet's servant went out. And he looked up and he saw all those soldiers surrounding the city. And he, he ran back inside and said, My Lord, what shall we do? Elisha didn't even bat an eye. He didn't even go out and look. He said, Don't worry, there's more of us than there are of them. Yeah. Amen. And then he said, uh, Lord, open his eyes. Talking about the servant. Open his eyes. Well, his eyes were open. He'd already been out there and seen them soldiers. His, his natural eyes. But there's some eyes on the inside that he wasn't seeing with. He said, open his eyes. When he opened his eyes, he looked up and he saw the whole city surrounded with chariots of fire. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You see, that prophet, he knew that there's more of us than there are of them. Not because he saw anything, but because he'd read Psalm 34, 7. Are you listening to me? Amen. You don't need to go out and see chariots of fire to know that they're out there. Why? Because you read Psalm 34, 7. You know the angel of the Lord camps around about those that fear him and delivers them. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And so the rest of the story is when you try to catch a prophet, you may wind up in trouble. Because then the prophet said, to strike them blind, Lord. And so him and his servant captured the whole army and led them over and turned them back over to their, where they came from. Amen. <laughs> Here, y'all lost these folks. Amen. Remember over in Second Chronicles, there were the story of Jehoshaphat. Remember that? Now, Israel hadn't been all that uh, holy. Uh, Jehoshaphat was trying to lead a revival, and he was getting everything all squared up, you know, and trying to get the sacrifices going in the temple again, and having a little revival there in, in Judah. And... Uh, just, to, just as he's kind of got things rolling, all of a sudden, here comes these three uh, kings after him to try and, and attack him and overtake him. And he got all upset, you know. Called a prayer meeting. Good idea. He can't figure out what else to do. And he began to pray in the 12th verse of chapter 20. He said, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us. Nor do we know what to do. Amen. <laughs> you ever prayed that way? <laughs> Nor do we know what to do. Amen. <laughs> I'm there just almost every day. Lord, I got no idea what to do about this. Amen. If you haven't ever been there, then you're just not being very honest. That's all I got to say. Or either that or you're just prideful. <laughs> Amen. Think you know what to do all the time. Amen. I don't know what to do. And he ended that sentence, he said, but our eyes are on you. Amen. I don't know what to do, Lord, but my eyes are on you. He said, now all of Judah, with their little ones, their wives, their children, uh, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of uh, all these other people with funny names, Mattathiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Hallelujah. Amen. Now there's a piece of information that you can put to use. The battle is not yours but God's. Glory to God. Every great victory begins by sitting down and shutting up. Amen. Amen. Really. The battle is not yours, but God's. Our eyes are on you. Get it. Amen. And you know what happened, don't you? Three armies came 
attacking Judah. Uh, they had another great revelation from the Lord the next morning when they got ready to go out to the battle, you know. He, the revelation was they put the choir in front of the army. They put the musicians in front of the army. Well, I guess if you've got an army that you can't win anyway, you might as well throw a little cannon fodder at them. I don't know what the theory was. But they put the, I, I think we, they put the worship team, they put the band in front of the army and sent them out. Uh, March, and they began to sing that wonderful song. Praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. And the Bible says, when they began to sing, when they began to sing, the enemy became, uh, in the King James it uses this word, I like this word, they became discomfited. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it sounds awful, don't it? Discomfited. It means confused. They got all flustered, and they started fighting amongst themselves until the point uh, they all killed one another. The three armies that was coming against Judah got mad at one another and killed each other, so that by the time uh, the, the uh, Jewish folks got there with the choir out in front, they, all the enemy was dead. Now think about that for a minute. The first time they ever saw the enemy, they were all dead. And that's my kind of problem right there. Amen. Remember I told you earlier, if you learn to pray about these things ahead of time, you'd be shocked about the stuff you don't have to do. Amen. A lot of stuff just disappears. It, I, I like it when my problems get discomfited, don't you? Amen. Amen. Uh, what I want you to see is uh, the battle is not yours, but it's God's. God has your back. He has always protected His people. Amen. Amen. And I got good news for you. We're talking about the Jews here. But in the New Testament, we're His people. 1 Peter chapter 2, the ninth verse says, You, talking to the church, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Turn to somebody and say, You special. His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. You are now the people of God. The Bible says you are now the people of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And God protects His people. Hallelujah. That's a good deal. Amen. In, in 1 Peter, he was talking to them about the persecution that they were facing in that day. He said, God has created you, His holy people, to proclaim His glorious light, and He has got your back. Amen. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody preach out of this or not. Verse uh, 4 says, we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness and all the persecutions and hardships you're suffering. Talking to the church. He said, and God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you're suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. I, mean, I don't think we ought to get all excited about that and say, get them, Jesus. You know. But, we need to understand, you know, the Bible says pray for those that persecute you. Why does it say that? Because they need it. Amen. When, you, when somebody's messing with God's people, they're in line to get slapped, man. He said he will pay back those who persecute you. Hallelujah. I mean, when you read that, that, that verse that says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If, if you're on the wrong side of that verse, that can be a chilling idea. Hallelujah. Well, let's read a little further. And God will provide rest for you. Hallelujah. I like that, don't you? Who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from His glorious power. When He comes on that day, He will receive glory from His holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you, 
for you believed what we told you about him. Amen. I don't think I've heard anybody preach out of that passage, but that's in the New Testament. Amen. That's in uh, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. He's going to pay back those folks that are messing with us. So we need to pray for them. Why? Because they need it. Amen. God protects his people. God protects his servants. Did you know that? Amen. I, I've always been uh, amazed at Numbers chapter 12. You know, how many of you believe Moses was a great prophet, leader of God? Amen. Moses, a big, he a pretty big deal. Amen. Well, in, in Numbers chapter 12, his brother and sister got crossways with him. I know that none of you have ever said anything this stupid, but just in case you've thought about it, let me warn you, because I've had people say things this stupid to me. When I first got born again, filled with the Spirit, I even had a few of these stupid thoughts my own self. Come on. Because, see, we all get to thinking to ourselves, well, wh who does he think he is? See, that's the, that's the Spirit that uh, brings you into a place where you're setting yourself up to get slapped. Said they were in Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? That's dangerous ground. See, there's just enough truth in that to convince yourself because of course he has spoken through them too. The Bible calls Miriam a prophetess. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, when uh, God called Moses, one of his first complaints to the Lord was, you know, I got a stutter. I can't go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He said, that's okay. I'll send Aaron. He'll speak for you. So yeah, God has spoken through Aaron. All right. He was appointed by God to be Moses' spokesman. So uh, they, were, they were telling the truth. Yeah, God has spoken through us. All right. But that don't put you in charge. Come on. That misses the point. The next phrase in that, hasn't he spoken through us too? And it says, but the Lord heard them. Oh, that's cold words. The Lord heard them. It said, now Moses was very humble, more humble than any person in the earth. So immediately, the Lord called them out. He called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them, if you're ever having a conversation talking ugly about the servant of God, and all of a sudden there's a voice from heaven say, come outside. <laughs> you're about to have a bad day, trust me. <laughs> then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. My, my, my. Aaron and Miriam, he called. Whoa. They stepped forward. The Lord said to him, Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams. But not so with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he's the one I trust. Do you know God speaks through a lot of people that he don't trust? I mean, we got a donkey in the Old Testament. You know. <laughs> my servant Moses, of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? Ouch. And the Lord was very angry with them. You know what the Lord does when he's very angry? It says, and he departed. Bummer. Of course, the rest of the story then is up to this point in time, Moses still has not spoken a word. And uh, when the Lord departed, uh, Miriam became leprous, if you'll remember. And Aaron began to plead with Moses, please pray for Miriam to get the leprosy off of her. And Moses did. The first words that Moses speaks in this whole story is praying for his sister to be healed, asking God to forgive her. So that's why the Lord trusted Moses. 
See, I would have probably got mad and slapped both of them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Come on. Maybe I'll grow up someday. <laughs> My point is this. You, you don't be messing with the one that God put in charge. Yeah, God spoke through you, Miriam, and yeah, God spoke through you, Aaron. That's not the point. God didn't put you in charge. He don't trust you. Numbers chapter 16, they had a similar episode uh, with the sons of Korah. These guys were Levites. They were priests. God called them into the priesthood. And uh, they started saying exactly the same thing. Didn't God speak through us too? Didn't he call us too? Aren't we in the priesthood too? We're just as good as Moses. Moses heard that. The first thing he did was fall down on the ground and start praying for him. Why? Because he already knows what's going to be the end of this story. <laughs> that was the one where, if you'll remember, <laughs> Moses finally went to him and, and, and told all the people, you need to get away from Korah. <laughs> Just step back, step off. And then the earth opened up and sucked them all down into the hole. Remember that? Yeah. So what are you saying? I'm saying God protects his people. And he takes care of his chosen servants. Are you listening to me? Amen. Amen. First Peter 4, in the 14th verse. Talking about persecution. Peter said this, he said, Be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian. Why? For then the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. Amen. Every one of these stories is a manifestation of that principle. When you start receiving persecution for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you stand firm in your faith, then the spirit of glory and of grace will rest upon you. He will show up and help you. Amen. He will, when you realize that the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord, and you've got enough sense to begin to sing, for the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Then the enemy gets discomfited. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God comes upon you. And God shows up. And, amen. In Numbers 12, he said, And God descended and stood with them. Whew. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. God has got your back. Amen. I like to say it this way. Why? Because the Bible says it this way. God is on your side. You need to get that thoroughly in your heart. Because most people believe it until things don't go right for about 10 minutes. Amen. I've been doing this a long time. I've listened to a lot of people blabber. Sometimes I've listened to myself blabber. Things don't go right for a little bit. and You don't know why they're not going right for a little bit. And you think you've done all the wonderful things that you needed to do to make God bless you. And it's not going the way you thought it was going to go. And so the next thing comes out of your mouth is, God, why did you do this to me or why did you let this happen? Come on. No, God is on your side. <laughs> he has got your back. You need to get that through your head. Psalm 118.6 was a big one for me when I was cleaning up and sobering up years and years ago. It says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. If the Lord is on your side, what on the world would you be afraid of? Amen. Psalm 27, the first verse says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In the, the 46th Psalm, the first verse, he said, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. The 20th verse, or the 20th chapter in the 11th verse. I'm going to read the... the uh, I'm dying here for some reason. But God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. Those who are after me will be sent sprawling. Yep. I want to preach. I don't want to drag you around. The, uh, 
but God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. I said, God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. Do you think he looked over and saw God standing there? No. No. What's he saying? He's saying what he knows, not what he sees. God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. Those who are after me will be sent sprawling. I, I just picture a Charlie Chaplin movie here. I don't know about you. Some of you younger people, some of you old people, explain to people who Charlie Chaplin was. Because the next phrase is slapstick buffoons <laughs> falling all over themselves. A spectacle of humiliation no one will ever forget. I like that. Not that I feel any urge to have people fall around on the ground, but I like the fact that there's a fierce warrior that's at my side that has got my back and is going to take care of my enemies, and they're going to look, they're going to be discomfited. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God has got your back. The Amplified Bible in, in Hebrews 13, he, he uh, uh, took a kind of a, a uh, what should I say, put together a whole bunch of the verses that we've just been looking at. And uh, the writer of Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews 13, the fifth verse. He said, let your character or moral disposition uh, be free from greed, avarice, lust, and the craving for earthly possessions and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Assuredly not. Amen. So take comfort, and we're encouraged, and confidently and boldly we say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can anybody do to me? Hallelujah. Now, see, there's a fellow that's got some confidence that God is on his side. Amen. I know people that can sing the verses from Romans chapter 8. Amen. Having chosen them, he called them to come to him. Having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? We sang it tonight. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? We sang it, but do we believe it? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? If God is on your side, what on earth could you possibly be afraid of? Amen. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. He goes on to say, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing. Who will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised for, to life for us and is now sitting in the place of honor at God, God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or desolate or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today or worries about tomorrow or the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. A lot of people can quote that and then they walk around terrified all the time. Amen. Amen. Nothing, nobody can wrest you from his hand. And I, I don't know how to say this other than just to say, God is not out to get you. He already got you. Amen. He already got you, and now he's out to keep you. He's not trying to get rid of you. He's not, not trying to torture you or persecute you or, or a, a mess with your life. Some people make it sound like God just up there playing mental games with us. He let me suffer that so that I could learn something. It seems like he just sent you an email. Amen. I mean, he wrote you 66 books, for heaven's sake. He's not trying to get you. He's already got you. If you're a believer, you're already His. He has you, and He is determined to keep you for the purpose of you inheriting and fulfilling the plan and the will and the purpose for which He grabbed you in the first place. That's what He wants to happen. In Philippians 3.12, He said, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Why? That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Think about that for just a minute. What did he just say? He said that Jesus Christ has laid hold of you. He's not going to turn you loose. He has got you. And the reason he's got you is so that you can lay hold of that purpose for which he grabbed you. Amen. Amen. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ. God has got your back. Amen. Stand up. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Did you ever sing that old song about everlasting joy being upon their head? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and morning shall flee away, away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I always used to try to do. If everlasting joy is on my head, I move real quick, maybe I can see it. <laughs> Amen. Now, here, here's what I want you to do. God has got your back. So I'll turn around real quick and see if we can see it. Yep, there it is right there. Found it for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Wherever you are, I want you to be acutely aware of the presence of Almighty God and His holy angels. Not off out yonder somewhere, but right here. He said He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. Amen. Amen. He has got your back. He is on the scene. And the battle is not yours. It's His. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bow your heads for just a minute. If you're here tonight and you've never made that first-time commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and given your life to Him, 
Let him wash you clean in his own precious blood and come to dwell in you by the Holy Spirit. If you've never been born again the way the Bible talks about in the third chapter of John. And the only way that can happen is by you saying yes, by saying Jesus Christ. signed up before we get out of here. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whew. Thank you, Lord. One of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways that I make myself conscious of the presence of God is uh, I pray in the Holy Spirit. You know, there is a, an experience with the Holy Spirit that comes after salvation. But everybody that experiences salvation can receive it. The Bible calls it the baptism with the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, with that comes the capacity, like they did on the day of Pentecost, to speak in another language that you don't understand. It calls it speaking in other tongues. And uh, Sometimes when I get a little nervous, you know, and, and uh, feel the anxiety rising up in me, and I want to remember that God's got my back. He's right here. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Then uh, I begin to pray in that prayer language. And it reminds me that the same God who hovered on the face of the deep on the day of creation, that same Spirit dwells in me. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Amen. If you're here tonight and you've never had that glorious experience like they did on the day of Pentecost of being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues and you'd like to have someone pray for you about that tonight that you might receive it. If that's you, would you lift your hand where I can see it? You want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I see that one. Is there another one? There's another one. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you lifted your hand or you should have lifted your hand, on either one of those propositions. Come on down here with me and, and let's pray together. I just want to pray with you. Come on. We're just going to pray and then I'm going to ask you uh, give you some stuff to take home with you and pray with you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sir. What's your name? Kevin. Hi, Kevin.
And uh, I know that anytime you say this, is anybody struggling with fear? <laughs> hey, is it Tuesday? You know, right? Why? Because we live in a fallen world. All of us struggle with fear. But some of you have been battling it in this sense. It wakes you up in the middle of the night and your heart's beating and palpating and you're sweating. Amen. Yeah. It, it goes past just being a little nervous or a little anxious. short of breath. Anybody here that has those kind of assaults? Come on you. you might, okay, would you all come down here and let me pray for you? <laughs> Charles Caps used to say, I'm, I'm calling for everybody that needs prayer, and I'm not talking about the charismatic headache, which is very easily healed. I want people to have an actual problem. Okay? But that's kind of the way I feel about fear. Everybody's got fear, but some people have those panic stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God one more time our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer Awesome and power our God, our God. Oh, Jesus, we just thank you. I thank you for these precious people who came out on a Tuesday night. Father God, I thank you that everywhere they go, this night and the rest of this week, they're going to be looking around behind them because they just know that somebody's got their back. I thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.